Okay. Perfect. Got it. Perfect. Um, so for our opening question, it's a very general one. Um, we want to know what was your favorite chapter or passage from the book um, or your favorite, um, yeah, just your favorite thing about the book. And I can go first. I can give an example. Um, on page 128, I can't remember the title of it. I should have written that down. Um, it's called Touched. And Claire basically talks about buttons in the entire passage. Um, and she talks about how she remembers what her finger, she, she forgot what her fingers remember, which is buttoning. Um, Cause now we're just always putting sweaters over our heads and, and zipping things up. And she talks about the intimacy and personal relationship of buttoning up her mother's sweater. sweater. And she says that she thinks it's her first memory um, of uh, um, clothes, like her first memory. And it made me think what more dramatic. And my grandmother brought me this strawberry dress and I wore it every day and I didn't want to take it off. And that's, I think, my first memory that I have with an article of clothing. So who wants to go next? I can go next again. Um, just like full disclosure. So I ordered the book online and it only came today and I had to work and run errands, like I said earlier. So I've only read like the first four chapters of the book. Um, but I definitely think like the bit but so far that I liked the most was actually the prelude. And I really liked how it was so specific to kind of like a curatorial or especially like a fashion curators. Um, like language as well as kind of experience. And it's something that I hope as I read more that more of that will come through. And it seems like there's a chapter on like archive and curators. I'm hoping that there's more of that. But I also love that she used um, like we for that entire passage and kind of a, um, acknowledging more of the collaborative work of museums and curating, which I think often curators don't do. Yeah, Thank that's you, very, yeah. that's very, that's very, it's very true. And uh, as you read it, you realize that, I mean, that that's a question we want to address with you all a bit later in the session. But yeah, like, it's pretty much a, an autobiography, but like a big part of the book is about her work. Uh, and she sort of like opens this, opens this window for the reader to have a glimpse of this, like what, it, what seems like a very magical place to work in a full of like magical situations happening every day and all these incredible objects full of stories um but yeah it, it is is really wonderful because as you said like we don't we don't hear that those stories the stories very often um anyone else wants to share like what was your favorite thing about the book in general just as an introduction i'll go if no one else is um so I think for me, the main thing was, you know, obviously maybe I'm a bit biased because I'm really interested in the senses, um, but this kind of very sort of sensual, very sensorial approach to writing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just looking at my phone where I've saved some of the notes here, but it's in the chapter titled Night Clothes. And she talks about, um, I think it's Edwardian uh, bedclothes that she's picking up and sniffing and the smelling of kind mm. of powder and... Uh, the smell of the iron and I think it's just sort of such a, a very sort of sensorial quality that's often missing from a lot of uh, kind of more stale writing about fashion and dress history. Yeah like she's it's really wonderful how she she's so descriptive about and there I think there is a, a chapter where she says it like that she says uh, when it comes to fabric it's important how it sounds and how it like feels against the skin and yeah, that you can hear it. Um, and it's really, really immersive, like the way she, she, she talks about the senses and about how she relates to clothes like centrally and yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. I'm the same as you, I related to it 
um, in terms of touch rather than scent. Um, touch was the passage that I read out earlier um, or spoke about earlier rather. And I think it, it just makes things a little bit more relatable when it's written in that sensorial tone and way of writing, um, which I found reading every page I found was so poetic. Like she just writes so beautifully and I, I genuinely just enjoyed reading. I was smiling as I was reading it or crying or it, it was just such a delight. <laughs> Who wants to go next? If not, we can move on. Yeah, I could I could go next. I mean, I'm not sure if I've got a favorite one because I've read the whole thing once and really tried to, to read in the, the most simple way. So without analyzing it at all. And usually I take notes when I read something, but this time I didn't do it. I said, okay, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna take this journey and see where it, it will take me. Uh, but in general, I couldn't agree more with, with Lily when she talked about the sensorial quality of the book. I think it's just so like poetic and like the way Claire takes the reader through the journey of your memories. And the book is just so full of, of images that you can even smell and feel. And when she describes an object, you can, it's like you are there and you can actually like touch it too. And, and it's amazing. And I think for, for those of us who've met Claire and we've heard her voice and all that stuff, it feels like she's narrating this, this story and she does it in the most persuasive way possible for, for me. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure I've got a favorite one, but so many different chapters, they really um, made me feel things, which is the, the most important thing, I guess. The power of writing. Yeah. 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 I personally also really enjoyed the sort of uh, mystery behind the stories, like the fact that she sometimes sort of uh, conceals the person she's talking about. Like you don't, you're not completely sure who she's talking about, but she makes you get very interested in this person. Like who is this person she's talking to? And like um, she gives sort of glimpses, like in the, in, there's a, a chapter when she talks about this, this woman she was talking to for, for a project and it makes you like you sort of assume it's probably Vivian Westwood like right because she curated an exhibition on Vivian Westwood but she never says her name and she does that quite a lot through the book um and I just found that like ability to write like that is very brilliant um so as we all noticed obviously like the book is a memoir uh written uh through the clothes of her life and it's pretty impressive how she i'm not quite sure how old is claire do, do you, any of you know how old she is um but she she remembers things with like incredible incredible detail like things from when she was a child even and um we would like to ask you like if you had to write a memoir through the course of your life, would you be able to? Do you have such vivid memories of the things you have worn and your loved ones have worn during your life? Like, would you be able to do that? Are, is your memory as, as, as clear as Claire seems to be? Okay, I might start. Um, so I don't know. I mean, initially I would think probably not, but then I can think of very specific items that I wore when I was little that I must have just been, you know, sort of so impressed by as a child that they've really stuck in my mind. So I had like a, a bright pink top with a kind of silver glitter. I think my mum must have let me go wild with my, my fashion choices that day. But, you know, I can really remember how it sort of, it felt on my skin or the feeling of wearing it, etc. So I think initially it might seem quite a difficult task but I think if you were to sit down and actually kind of think of these very specific moments in your life um I think maybe you would be able to kind of imagine them a bit more clearly I agree with that um recently I got Apple TV and I started listening to um it's a little off topic but it, it comes back um Matthew McConaughey's memoir and he had written he always writes, he always has a little notebook with him whenever he travels or when he wants to remember something or with photographs, he'll write behind them. And to write his memoir, he, he went somewhere in the US and locked himself up and took 
all of those little papers and kind of map them out and read them. And by doing that exercise, it jogged his memory. So I think that if you think about it now, it's probably so overwhelming. But if you actually sit down, I mean, the same way with writing a dissertation, we've all done that. I think that if you sit down and actually look at the garments of your life or the clothes that you've worn as a child and into teenagehood and adulthood, that some stories would come out and memories by just chatting with your mom or with your grandma um, that they would come out. Um, I don't think I would be able to start though. <laughs> that would be the hardest part is starting. Does anyone have anything to add? Yeah, actually what you said, Vanessa, really, uh, I can really relate it. It really resonates with me. Because so for this um, dressing memory project I'm working on, uh, and actually also for like when I was writing my dissertation and editing my film, what I was doing is I was doing this sort of like exercise and I was trying to, let's say, provoke myself to think, uh, to, to try to like bring some memories up the, the, the surface. And sometimes I was like, while I, I was writing the dissertation, I was thinking that some memories are not exactly true or authentic, if that makes sense. So some things I could really say that, okay, yeah, I'm thinking about this now, but is it true? And there were times that I couldn't be like 100% sure that what I was thinking of was something that really happened. So let's say I was in front of this museum object and I was, um, I could see it in the, in the footage and I was thinking about it and I was trying to write something about it, but like all the, um, let's say, the thoughts I had, I couldn't be sure if they were um, real or not. But then, uh, and that's what I'm doing now with this project, what, um, what I'm thinking is that it doesn't really matter. So while I was reading Claire's book, I wasn't sure if all these things that she mentions are true, but like, who cares? Because in a way, it's like you like through your memories, you can, like you're allowed to curate this story and create a different kind of story um, for you and for your life. And it doesn't really matter if the, the, all these things really happened, um, but it's the story that you want to, to tell and you're allowed to, to, to say it, if, if that makes sense. That's such an interesting, concept isn't it because it, it is true like um when one reads a memoir it's hard not to ask yourself like how honest is this person being yeah. but then as you said like how honest can we really be like how how much of what our memory tells us is like what really happened and i mean we can go beyond that and get even more philosophical and be like okay what's reality but we're not going to get there right now because we're not going to get out of that hole. Um, but, but yeah, at the end of the day, does it matter? Because if we remember it this way, that's, that's all it matters. And probably the feelings that relate from our mem that memory, even if we fabricated it, it's, it's what really matters. Uh, so that's a very, very interesting, I think that's a very interesting concept. Um, yeah, and I think even like in, in terms of clothes and what we wear, if I am wearing a necklace today and I feel like, you know, this necklace is da -da 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 about me and I feel like, okay, this is my favorite necklace and I, I, I've constructed all this idea around a necklace. Does it really matter if, I mean, I'm not talking about being like crazy about objects and like just create stories that are not true and sharing them with others. But in a way, if I've really convinced myself that this sweater and that t-shirt and that necklace really mattered to me does it really matter if it was I don't know a friend who gave it to me or if it was um my mom's or like whatever you know what I mean yeah all it matters that you've created a connection with a, a garment with an object and you can really relate to it and it makes you feel things I guess <laughs> So this actually perfectly segues into the next question. Wait, um, this, I think I think Lily had. Oh, Lily, Lily wanted to say something. So yeah, 
No, it's all right. I didn't want to hijack the conversation. No, I was just going to say, um, I Go think ahead. that's a super interesting, um, a super interesting point. And I think Claire says something later in her book that relates to that quite well about um, something along the lines of it was only a museum because we said it was about a cupboard in her house. I think she's talking about. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's interesting the kind of the symbolism or the significance that we give to stuff um, and kind of deciding who gets to say what's important or what's what's relevant, what needs to be preserved. Yeah, and isn't that the job of a curator to do exactly that? Is to construct stories around objects and create stories that people connect with. Um, so we know. <laughs> click Sorry, go ahead. No, go, go on, babe. No. Um, so Claire is a fashion curator at a museum at the VNA, and she offers us a very small glimpse into that world in a few of her chapters and a few of her passages. And I'd like to know what are your thoughts on this and which of those passages stood out for you. And I can I can give you an example that one that stood out for me. Um, because if you can imagine all that goes into collecting and preserving garments as a curator, if we, we look at that from the lens of the curator, it's very different than if you're just reading it and not actually paying attention. And the one that stuck out for me was called Imprint. And it's when she curated the exhibition on Frida Kahlo. And she talks about how, um, I mean, back then, um, Me the medical field wasn't as advanced so they had to put a cast on her torso very tight with her corset um, to get the plastered mold and when they removed it part of that was on of on the corset of her dress and Claire analyzed that in the exhibition when they were going to put it on display and she talks about how she sees the actual like rib cage of Frida Kahlo inside the corset like so crazy um to think of that and yeah I guess which I guess what we're asking is which which passage did you connect with did you get a glimpse into curating and preserving and the wear and tear of garments is it something that you've ever thought of is it something you think of and I'll leave that open To me, well, while uh, the rest of the group is uh, is thinking of this question, um, I think one of my my favorite parts of the book relating Claire's work as a curator uh, at the VNA it's um is the first chapters when she's just starting working there and she feels very inadequate and she feels like she's not as knowledgeable or as like clever as the rest of the as the other curators when she starts as, a, as an assistant and um and everything is like it's new and exciting i mean she she keeps talking about it like every like it's exciting but at the very beginning it's not it's not the clear we know now right that is like this eminence like it's, it's just a girl that got her first serious job and, and she's excited. Um, so to me, that was really, really great to read because um, everything else, of course, is fascinating, but uh, we sort of, maybe because of like my, my background studying fashion curation, I sort of like get some ideas of how, how it is to curate in a museum, but just felt her being very vulnerable uh, as a young, as a young person being like, this is new, this is huge. And I wonder if I am, if I am good enough to be here. Uh, just, it, it was very heartwarming for me. Do you guys have any thoughts regarding uh, the, the passages on the museum? Yeah, um, I absolutely love that bit too. Um... I totally agree it's that kind of feeling of which I think we've all felt where you feel totally out of your depth in a situation and that everyone else must know much more than you um, and I think it's really refreshing to see someone um, 
of sort of Claire Standing speak about it in that way. Um, for me, one of my favourite passages, sorry, my eyes keep darting down, I've just got it on my phone, <laughs> yeah. um, was the chapter called Too Late. And she kind of talks about being in the gallery in this very, um, I think it's in the silver gallery. And she talks about it in this very kind of haunted way and imagining almost like the ghosts that are meant to be there and, you know, being in a museum after dark, etc. cetera. Um, and I just absolutely love that. I think there's something so kind of interesting about that feeling of kind of hauntedness um, that you can sometimes feel particularly in sort of, you know, smaller archives or, you know, more remote archives, that kind of feeling that, sort of haunts you um, of being around someone's possessions and kind of being very knowing in that as well. Yeah, I agree. And I, um, how she, just, I think just the way she gets obsessed with the specific objects and she talks about them uh, in these chapters and the little glimpses she gives to how she's really feeling while she's uh, dealing with these objects, like, I thought it was very interesting. There's a part where she says, like, I deal with these objects, trying, like doing my best not to remember that all that the people that warned this is dead. Like all the people that ever warned this is dead now. So I try not to think that. Um, yeah, that's a very specific feeling, isn't it? You know, and I think sometimes it can feel quite um quite separate or quite disjointed when you're studying item stress, but of course it shouldn't be, it should be very intertwined. Yeah, it must be it must be hard not to not to be thinking that and perceiving these objects as a reminder that we are all uh, that we are all uh, mortals, uh, and that time is like a very this very intangible thing that goes goes fast, and that we are all going to the same place. Uh, so the, yeah, I guess there's like that's probably the bittersweet part of uh, dealing with fashion collections in in archives. I wonder. I think this is like, this is a good question to ask Claire when we see her um, during the conversation. Definitely. Yeah, actually, I I love the first chapters too, and one of like my favorite passages I was trying to find it now uh, comes from comes from the chapter um, the ladder, and so I just found it, I guess, like quite different than others because it's quite amusing. And I found it really funny and interesting how she describes her work at the textile store. And I think it's just brilliant how she makes all these comments like this one that says, sometimes we spend the afternoons answering inquiries. Now and again, we'd receive a letter addressed to the Victorian Albert Museum. It always amused us. And I think it's quite special that she does that, like in terms of writing. And also, it, I think comments like that, they come with, some sort of like naivety about like all these things that were happening in her life at that time. I also think that it's quite beautiful that she writes about the like she thinks about the object first when she writes about anything and that's what that's how we we feel the love that she has being a curator because she puts so much attention into the stories that the clothes tell. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like the, the objects are always like the starting points for ev any memory and everything she, she talks about and writes about, which is quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to say something as well, but I can't speak to a specific passage, unfortunately, but I am, like I said, hopefully going to get to that part and excited to read it. But one of the things I also noticed is that she mentions a lot related to like laundry and ironing and steaming clothes and kind of also like related to this idea of like object first it reminded me a lot of um like material culture fashion history articles so like even you know Lou Taylor's article like doing the laundry and also Valerie Steele's um like a museum of fashion is more than a clothes bag um, so that's kind of just something that stood out to me when she was talking about laundry, but then also like this object centered approach was actually maybe she's making some kind of reference, or at least she's very much a part of that conversation from that time as well. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And also, that's very linked to, to exactly what we want to talk about first, like we, 
identified a few recurrent themes uh, in the book uh, through her life. And we think a very clear one is the relationship between dress and, and work. Like she talks quite a lot about all the jobs she had before working in the museum. And it's very interesting how all of those jobs are related to dress in one way or another. Like we read how she uh, worked in this um, in this shop where they saw like Victorian and Edwardian like underwear and she worked like doing laundry and she uh, worked in, um, in a fabric shop and then she worked in a sex shop, which is completely unexpected uh, considering like that Claire seems like this, uh, she self she self described as a very shy person. And, but then she went and had this like sex work in this sex, sex shop where uh, she was also dealing with, with garments, with other kind of garments. Um, so, and, and she also talks about what she wears to work and how like when in her late stage of, of, a, of being a curator, she wears all black. That's her, like her uniform to go to work. And like, there's this, this lovely passage in a chapter called The Skirt that says, the fabric was an eye cut in delicate shades of gray and pink. The pattern diffused because the work had been dyed before the weft was woven through. This much I had learned about waving techniques from my short time working at the museum, although now I suspect that it was printed. Either way, I thought it would look good with a white t-shirt, and that's what I worked the next morning, for it was the summer of my first proper job. I set off on my back down the Fulham Road, hair flying behind me, running late as always. Um, so regarding this theme, dress and work, um, We'd like to know what are your thoughts about that, and if you relate in any way, if you can like, if you can remember uh, what you work, what you were to your first job, or even we think I, I I kind of feel like working in retail or in clothes shops is is a kind of job most of many people has as a young person as a teenager. Like I, I did had a, had a job in a boutique back in Mexico when I was a teenager. And um, did you did you ever have a job like Claire working with clothes? And if you did, like, uh, how did you relate to that? How did you relate to the clothes? I feel like I asked many different questions <laughs> in one, but uh, you feel free to answer, to pick one and just answer that one. Or just anything that comes to mind on the topic. Yeah, sure, I just, can... Oh, sorry, go on. Well, no, you go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I just wanted to say that for me, it's just really interesting how um, this topic, let's say this theme of like the relationship between dress and work, it's really evident in her work as a curator, if that makes sense. So it's really great how all these different jobs somehow enhanced her, I don't know, curator skill set in a way. And you can really see it in because like the the way she takes you through that journey is like okay it's like I've learned this and this and this and it's like a, a jigsaw puzzle in a way and she she managed to get all these different um skills because of all the different things she did and I think that like especially if you worked in retail that sort of like applies to to everyone who did it because you're there and for many hours you're like okay what am I doing here and why am I here and like I want to go but then you realize that wait I'm actually like learning something even, even if I don't realize it now the way I'm handling objects here uh, even if they're not like historical garments it's still like it teaches me something absolutely Lily did you want to say something yeah, definitely. Um, well, firstly, I totally agree with that point. I think, um, yeah, after a few different retail jobs, you don't appreciate it at the time. And then you, you know, you go into a different career and you're like, oh, wow, that's coming really useful. <laughs> you know, a very niche skill that you maybe picked up when you're like 16, um, being a Saturday girl. But um, for me, the part that really resonated was when she's talking about working in the sex shop. Um, so I used to work in a lingerie shop and obviously um, my research interests kind of revolve around sort of eroticism um, 
and for me that was the job that I had in my first year of university and I think it was kind of really interesting at the time you know to read the books of like Valerie Steele on fetishism etc but then to actually go to work and see it kind of acting out and seeing it in person um, and seeing how people related to clothes in sort of a very different setting um, I think that was actually a really valuable experience as well. So I think it, it's funny how these experiences, um, you know, which yes, they can make for funny stories, et cetera, but actually they can be uh, really sort of valuable learning experiences as well. Now you're on mute. Sorry, I was gonna ask, uh, ask you Lily, do you think your job in the lingerie shop influenced your, uh, your like, research topic now that you're into yeah totally um I think I was quite interested in it before I worked in the lingerie shop so it, it you know it kind of fed each other naturally um in relation to scent I think there are definitely some interesting things again kind of relating to this more sort of material culture um approach to fashion and fashion history um for me something I remember very specifically is if you wear latex clothes you have to put on you know like talcum powder or sometimes they use like a specific um like a, a lubricant to put it on it has a very distinct smell um and I think things like that you know you don't again you don't appreciate it at the time then you look back and you can kind of uh, think about how clothes have sort of different meanings or more sensorial meanings etc so yeah it definitely influenced um later sort of academic research oh that's awesome that's so interesting and like this point you guys are just making is something I didn't actually think about before like that um maybe yeah working with clothes as a teenager definitely definitely maybe in a, in an unconscious level uh had something to do with like me ending up like going to do a master's on something related to clothes and ultimately founding a a, a festival that is about clothes and uh yeah that's really really interesting that and I yeah just handling handling the clothes in the shop and like helping clients to get dressed and telling them what looks what well, you, you tell them that everything looks good on them obviously because that's part of the job uh, but that's probably that's probably one of, one of the first very serious encounters we have uh, with with material culture and, and clothes that's yeah it's a very interesting thing and can I just say on that point as well, um, again, not to hijack the conversation, no, go ahead. Um, but I was just thinking again, um, something I really learned when I was working in, uh, in that job, but in retail in general, and I'm sure you maybe had similar experiences, is you're kind of exposed to how uh, intimate you can be with people, you know, when they're getting changed or when you can see people's emotions change or, you know, people, I think people feel quite vulnerable in that situation maybe. So they're quite, um, they can talk to you quite openly or they can be quite you know emotional I think it's one thing to read about that in an academic paper but you know it's different to kind of be there and experience it with people and understand you know what a, a big part um clothing can play in people's lives yeah I've actually had a similar experience and I only realized it or I think subconsciously I knew but I realized it when I wrote my cover letter um to apply for London College of Fashion um I worked in VM for about like eight or nine years of my life, uh, visual merchandising, sorry. Um, so I dealt with clothes every single day. And as you were just mentioning now, Lily, the intimacy, not only of the people trying on the clothes, but for me, it was the intimacy of touching the clothes and feeling the vulnerability of the fabrics when I would have to steam silk, when I would have to fold cotton you know it was just that like sensorial feeling and I think that actually is what led me into the direction of leaving like luxury fashion and going into curating fashion and telling those more intimate stories um, because I felt that connection having touched them every day and putting them on mannequins and taking them out and yeah it in hindsight, like it was very much correlated. And it's very, it's very interesting how it's actually like having people coming to the place where you're working and getting undressed and getting dressed and needing your help. It's a very intimate thing that we probably gave for granted when we were doing it. But in hindsight, uh, 
yeah, it's just interesting because you don't know that those people, but they are they are doing this very intimate ritual right next to you and you are taking part in it. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really great point. Do you have any thoughts on, on this, Anna? Did you ever have a, a retail job? Yes, yeah, so I think all of my jobs before I've had like a proper job um, have been in retail. So I think I have similar experiences of just um, like gaining skills that I would necessarily have about like steaming, how to fold shirts, um, knowing more about fabrics. I think I worked in shops that often I get questions about fabrics and composition and um, you know, like deep hilling. Like sometimes people would come in and say their sweater, their cashmere sweater has been really pilled. So you have to deep pill it for them. So it's like all these processes of like taking care of fashion and garments. Um, but also like talking to people about them, like the vocabulary as well. But Lily, I imagine working in a lingerie shop would be very intimate. I can, I know you like, you measure people and you would see like so much of their skin exposed as well. So that must've been a really interesting experience. Yeah, definitely. And I think just by the nature of, you know, someone stood there in their underwear, it just brings out a different side of them. Um, you know, people are much more open to kind of share stories or I guess they, they understand that it's a very sort of safe space to do so. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a very sort of valuable experience in that way of being able to listen to people and um, yeah, so understand it as a ritual. I think that's the, the best way of describing it, the ritual kind of dressing and dressing. Um, yeah. Also, I just wanted to add, cause I, so I'm starting a new job, which is why I'm moving to Germany, which is very not fashion curating or museum related, which is what I did before. Um, but it's going to be like doing working as an editor for a fashion company and part of the reason I really like the idea of this job is actually they bring all of the clothes into the company and then like into the office and you get to like touch them see them and then like you're writing about them and styling them so I think um, that to me is like way more exciting than just seeing a picture of the clothes and then writing about them as well. That's amazing. That sounds like a really, that sounds like a really cool job. Yeah, congrats. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, it's very different. different. I think that's why archives are so special to everyone, or at least maybe to us, um, because you, you get free access to a world of just being able to touch things and see them rather than in a photograph. And oftentimes when they're photographed, um, I'm a collection review assistant at a museum in Tunbridge Wells, and there's photographs in the database that are so dated that don't show the details, the little rips, or um, the fact that it doesn't even fit the mannequin, that it was maybe made for a teenager. Like these are little details that you can only tell when you actually handle the garment. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's an incredible experience to have, to be able to do that. That's so funny from my, sorry, I just wanted to, cause it's so interesting thinking about the middle and the end result of these clothes and uh, my experience in fashion has been sort of at the very beginning because I was in fashion casting and so you were uh, in terms of the ritual and dressing undressing with models there is that kind of is taken from them um, because you just have to uh, there's there's a ritual the stylist is going through a ritual but the model kind of does end up being like a mannequin in a way so they're kind of stripped of that ritual and they're standing in their underwear in front of all these people but also you're there at the genesis of these garments sometimes um, and it's really fun around fashion week when they're when you're there and they're casting and they'll they'll be doing the fittings and making adjustments and the seamstress will be there and well they're good at sewing the designers so they'll just clip it on as well um so it's yeah it's kind of fun hearing all these different stories and different stages of a garment's life that the room this room has experienced it's really nice and the models are dressed i mean they're dressed by the stylist and they're dressed by by the assistants right and there's like this uh i mean there's a lot of you're touching the model and as you said like the model suddenly becomes just like a, a mannequin almost like a, not a person even because there's no boundaries between the person who's dressing her and and her yeah. body 
there was this terrifying t- moment when um so I, I, the first year we were with Balenciaga and I was um and it was there it was like Dem, the Demna and Lotta Volkova's first year taking over the brand and uh I was like getting the model in line and um the stylist Lotta Volkova is this like fierce uh Russian chick who doesn't take who's is pretty intimidating but pretty incredible at the same time and um I like and it was one of the big puffer jackets and I like took her from the elbow and then her face like I was like messing up the crease of the elbow (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he shot me like the most terrifying look um so that was quite amusing. that was a learning curve don't touch the clothes when they're on the model <laughs> <laughs> that sounds mortifying <laughs> um it's actually ironic that you mentioned that they're almost like a mannequin because in latin drive languages like french or italian models are called mannequins like they say mannequin or manichino um and it's interesting why in English, we call them models and not mannequins. Just putting it out there. I don't know what I thought that I just had. You don't um, have that. That's super interesting. Yeah. Just before moving away from the topic of uh, dress and work, like another another thing that really jumped up to me was Claire working as a, a life drawing model, um, which is like in a way it's like the opposite metaphor to all of the rest of her jobs like this is a job where she had to be completely naked and be exposed to um, people looking at her body and like drawing her and she didn't have to do anything else she just had to be there naked uh, which again is, is just as a sex shop job is very interesting because she you will never guess that uh that she was comfortable doing, having that kind of job. And it made me remember that when I first came to London and I, 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 was, I had a job as a nanny, but I also had a job as a part-time life drawing model uh, in this art school uh, here in London because they paid cash and they paid well. <laughs> and I needed the cash. Full disclosure. <laughs> Full disclosure, yeah. Um, and it, it was... It was a very interesting experience. Um, I don't know if you if you've ever had like the experience of maybe being in a nudist bitch or just in a situation when you're completely naked in front of people that are not like that you don't know basically. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a very unique thing. I don't think I don't think you 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 get to experience that that, that feeling in, in any other way. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you guys had any thoughts on that specific, that specific chapter <laughs> of Claire Claire's experience. Yeah, I do. Solidarity with the life models for cash jobs in London. <laughs> I was also a life model too. So <laughs> um, yeah, I feel you on that one. But yeah, I think there's something interesting um, in Claire's book where she, I can't quite remember how she words it, but it's something about, you know, when she puts the clothes on, she kind of feels much more conscious of it in a way and I think that's so true because you know there's something about I mean it's very sort of basic fashion theory but the idea of you know the nude is not as kind of um erotic as perhaps the partially closed body right um you know or the naked body is is not as uh, necessarily erotic as a a partially closed body and Mm. I think it's interesting um and particularly when you're working as a life model um again I'm not speaking for everyone, but just off my own experience, but it's, I think you maybe don't feel as conscious as the other people in the room, but to the fact that you're naked sometimes, you know, because for you it's work again, um, you're doing your job and then, but for other people, it might be, you know, the first time they've, they've drawn someone nude or, or something. So sometimes you feel that other people are more shocked than, than you are in that state. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, for me, I, I was just like, I was just like trying to like reminding myself constantly that there's those people there were not actually giving, putting attention to my bodies, but my body was nothing but like uh, a series of shadows and lines that they were trying to replicate. <laughs> That's what I would tell myself repeatedly. Uh, but again, I think this is a particular thing that will be very interesting to ask Claire uh, when we see her like, what what took you to work uh, as a life drawing model 
Um, yeah. I'm curious to see her answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so if Chile, oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, sorry. go ahead, go ahead, go <laughs> ahead. I, I just wanted to say that, like, this just crossed my mind that I think we've developed these really like special connections with our clothes, but sometimes they can they can be quite restricting in a way. And we don't always realizing the same way we don't realize that we have this special uh, connection, sorry, with, um, with our clothes. Because I think, for example, um, the naked body in a nudie speech, as Naomi mentioned, it does feel liberating. And sometimes it's maybe this absence of, of clothes that it, um, I think it might make us realize that you know, when I am wearing clothes, it does feel different. So because we're wearing clothes all the time, sometimes we might not really realize that something is happening there. But then when we, when we don't have them, then maybe we start thinking about them um, more and in a, in a deeper way in terms of how they affect us and how they make us look and how they change us. It's very... That point is very interesting because it does, it's very true that in an unconscious level, like when we're wearing something specific, we do behave in a specific way. So like, how do we behave when we're not wearing anything? Uh, and that's probably, that's probably an interesting question to explore. And I, I don't know if that's like something you Lily are looking into your dissertation, for example, like um, all the, uh, all these um, issues around like, clothes and sensations and feelings and, and suddenly not being wearing absolutely anything and who we are, who are we like when we're not wearing anything and what's, yeah, what's what's our personality when we're like completely naked? Because as you said, Eleni, we're always wearing something or almost always wearing something and that something is always influencing us. Uh, so thinking of nakedness as like negative space, like what, yeah, what happens with us there? Yeah. And also on the topic of like this connection with clothes um, and how they make you feel different ways. We also found another reoccurring theme in the book, which is dress and travel. So we're gonna pose the question, like does traveling inspire you to dress in a different way? And that connection that you build with something that you see when you're traveling that you purchase um, when you're on a trip. Um, there's a passage that I'd actually like to read out loud, um, two short passages. It's on page 30 and 31, if you'd like to follow along. They're quite short. Um, I swapped my tight jeans for flowered tunics and harem pants and wrapped a scarf around my head for modesty and for the dust. And this is um, Claire talks about when she's on a bus to Istanbul. And then later on, she on page 31, the last paragraph, she says, I saw a tiny drawstring purse and thought by its fineness that it wasn't that it was old and have it now beside me. Knowing we might never go back, I bought a dress. I longed for it because it was heavy, because its heavy embroidered yoke and mirrored scales seemed like a breastplate for our time. Do any of you have either thoughts on this passage and Claire's connection to? to traveling and the clothes that, or items that she bought rather, or just your personal experiences with traveling and buying something. I know that usually when I travel, because I'm from a cold country, um, I'm from Canada, so I have plenty of warm clothes. And oftentimes I find myself when I go to tropical destinations, always buying something maybe in linen or silk, something that's light that I can wear and easily carry with me. Um, and yeah, that's all related to everything we've been talking about today is that sensorial um, aspect. Does anyone want to add to that or have any thoughts? I will go. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have anything super profound to say, but um, I think what's really 
lovely about that passage is it kind of really speaks to this idea of you know when you travel and you maybe feel so inspired and then think okay I'm going to totally change myself and I'm going to transform myself and you know I'm going to be this type of person when I go back and often the way that you do that is you know through buying clothes or trying to transform yourself through clothes and it doesn't always uh, last when you get back to England um, but yeah I think there's something quite interesting about that I know the last time I went to Italy pre-pandemic I was thinking wow everyone's so glamorous the women are so strong you know I had all of these visions of being sort of the Dolce Vita and then you get back to rainy London and it kind of doesn't work out quite the way that you imagined but um yeah I I love that passage I thought it was a really interesting um way that she referred to it as um a breastplate a breastplate for our time I think it's just such a gorgeous sentence absolutely and it goes back to what Eleni was saying earlier about how um, oh my god I just lost my train of thought when you uh, the absence of clothes and when you actually put on your clothes it makes you actually think about them um, and I think that's so beautiful and it's so true because when you're on holiday um, you actually think more about what you're going to wear because you're packing it and you're putting it in a suitcase to bring with you and then you see something that inspires you in the street <clears throat> Or in a yeah, and sometimes you've got it all planned like what yeah. you're gonna wear and how and where and yeah 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 that's very interesting and actually in terms of like traveling and clothes um I think this this topic comes with lots of like bittersweet feelings for me because I've moved places quite a lot in in the past years and so I had unfortunately I had to get rid of many things um along the way and many of them were like um clothes and shoes uh because like when you when you need to move like countries or houses even like you can't take everything with you and at some point like because I, I was um I used to live in Barcelona and so when I moved from Barcelona to uh to London uh I was really fed up you know with all this stuff and I said okay you know what I'm gonna have like two luggage with me and the rest stays here I gave it to I like I gave things away to friends and I had to actually bin some stuff so it felt a bit like weird like this whole process but when I was reading this chapter the one that you uh you read uh Vanessa it really like it might remind me of uh of something it reminded me of a pair of traditional Moroccan shoes or slippers. I'm not sure what's what's the right word for it. Uh, I had bought them in, in Morocco some years ago and I could, honestly, I couldn't wear them like outside. They were really uncomfortable. They felt like wood, they weren't that nice. <laughs> I remember one, one time, only one time I wore it and I was with a friend back in Barcelona and she was like, what are you wearing? Like, what is this? Like, how, like, did you realize when you left home that you're wearing this thing? And I was like, yeah, I know it doesn't really, like, I wasn't 100% sure about them, but still, you know, I had to bargain for them. And I, I like, it, they came with lots of memories. But then when I was packing myself in Barcelona, I, I left them there. I was just going to ask that. Did you keep yes, them? Yes, no, I <laughs> left them. And I've regretted it, like, so much because... This actually, this is a memory that comes to, to mind quite often. And uh, one time, I don't remember why, I think I bought something. So this summer I did quite a lot of like traveling around Greece and I bought several stuff. And so I was talking to my partner and I told him that, you know what, I, I remember these like slippers quite a lot uh, from Morocco and I wish I had kept them, but I didn't. And it feels really weird, you know, when you know that you've left something behind but I've got like pictures of them and I so yeah I don't know yeah I'm not quite sure like what to say about this because I feel very like weird and emotional about the fact that okay I know it's just a pair of shoes but then they they come with like lots of memories and they also come with the fact that okay like I I went to a really kind of like different countries, countries than, than others. And um, yeah, so I don't know, this, this traveling and buying stuff and stuff, it feels weird for me. And well, just wanted to put it out there. Yeah, but you're, you're expressing your life amongst yeah. clothes, which is exactly what we're talking about here today. It's the yeah. memories that are trapped in the clothes that we wear. And um, I can totally relate to what 
you're saying, I'm, I know that now can as well, moving from Mexico and me from Canada and Iana actually from Canada as well. And now to Germany, um, you're going to have to select what you're going to have to bring. And I've gone through that process. I mean, every time I go back home, I still have things that, and I've gotten rid of a lot of things, <laughs> but there yep. are still a lot of things that I can't get rid of because there are memories attached to them. And even if they don't fit me anymore, or they're not necessarily representative of my style now as a 30 year old woman, um, I still keep them because they're special. There's, there's a memory attached and it's so powerful and, you know, we're not necessarily always ready to let them go. So thanks everything for sharing you, that. Yeah, no, everything you guys just said resonates so much, like so much uh, with me, like everything. Like it's so true that Lily, that every time, every time I travel, I sort of create this like persona in my trip, like that is dressed for the place. And I totally think that I can pull that off back home. I totally think that, oh my God, yes, I should dress like this in London. And it, I will, it, will, it was gonna be amazing. And as soon as you're back, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You feel ridiculous. And I also, I also went to Morocco and I also bought a pair of slippers from Marrakesh. And like those, those, the slippers, I have like a, like a point, like a, like a 12 point in the front yes exactly yes and I thought I was gonna wear them so much and I've never worn them because they indeed they look ridiculous if you're not yeah. in Morocco and they're so uncomfortable <laughs> and they're very <laughs> uncomfortable too um so yeah it's, it's, it's very funny and also every time I travel I um I'm a bit of a slave of consumerism in that sense because I do like buying something uh when I'm away I like to go to a vintage shop and get something I like I like to get something um made in the place like last time I went to I went to Mallorca a couple of weeks ago and I I promised myself I wasn't gonna buy anything and I did end up buying like a, a yellow cotton dress that was made there in the island and I I loved it um but again as you work as, as you guys were saying like these are things that remind you of the experience of the trip in ways that not their object can help you remind, like remember it. Yeah, and I think um, as well, sometimes it kind of speaks to a part of your personality that maybe you want to embrace a bit more, you know, whether that be through like, I don't know, Moroccan slippers, maybe representing a part of you that's more brave or that would travel on their own or that would, you know, have the confidence to haggle. It's that type of um, kind of attachment that we sometimes place on things as, a persona of maybe the type of person we'd want to be or want to embrace more and I think that makes it so difficult to get rid of them because then it's like am I admitting defeat am I not this person you know it's it's um yeah I think it's where kind of emotions really uh, take hold I think you just encapsulated exactly why I can't get rid of a lot of things <laughs> yeah in a way yeah that's a very interesting question in a way this is is it admitting defeat or is it like not wanting to let go of someone we went, we once were? Uh, and these things, these objects represent that person I once was, but I'm not anymore. But am I completely ready to let go? I don't know. And then you let go and you regret it, like in the case of your sleepers, Lenny. I think it might also be that we are afraid that we might lose the memory of something. So if I don't have the actual object, am I going to remember like the day that I bought I bought the, the slippers or like whatever it is. And it feels weird to know that, okay, like we're growing up and we might like forget some things uh, along the way. Yeah, it's, yeah. A very, it's a very nostalgic feeling. Sorry, yeah. Anna. That's okay. I just wanted to say that I relate so much to what everyone is saying, especially because like I said, I'm moving. I'm in that process of basically packing two suitcases to bring with me and I'm on this purge of getting rid of things that have been like basically since I got I just got back from Canada a few weeks ago and all I've been doing is going through my stuff and I have been getting rid of things that have really strong memories actually just because I think like there's no way I'm gonna wear this if I move and I can't keep it here and you know things that I've had since I was a teenager even um but I was also thinking about 
you like we talked a lot about being inspired by a city and how that influences your dress but I think it's also a bit about fitting in as well because I know a guy lived so I've lived in Canada Sweden I lived in Scotland as well um now I'm moving to Germany and I feel like there are certain things that I would wear in those countries that I wouldn't wear in others so for example in Canada it's quite or at least in Vancouver it's very common to wear like sweatpants like leggings shorts out on the street which I would never do here <laughs> or like in Sweden but when I went back I was wearing like my little lemon shorts like out and about wasn't a big deal and then when I lived in Stockholm I wore a lot of like denim and like neutral black colors um right now I live in the countryside ish like just outside Brighton and I wear like a barber jacket if it's raining and again like those things I wouldn't wear in the other places and right now as I move I'm starting to think about okay what would I wear in Germany like what's the German style like who do I want to be when I go there and that's kind of um the process I'm going through as I get rid of things um and then just one last thing I hope it's okay to say because now and Ness are actually going to be writing an article about this for our collaboration. Um, and I think we, um, like Nora and I were talking about maybe doing the clubhouse on this topic. So Eleni and Lily, if you're interested in talking about it more, um, definitely get in touch with us because for Fashion Four, we're going to be talking about this more. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I'd love to. Yeah, um... Yeah, and uh, everything everything you just said resonates very very strongly as well. It's it's funny that in in this group, like we all have that experience of moving and having to say goodbye to things and having to curate ourselves over and over again. And like what did you said is very interesting. Like almost like, okay, so who is like who is Naomi in Morocco? Who is Naomi like? Who's Anna in Germany? How 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 is she gonna look like? Almost like if you were like a like a doll, like I don't know if you like I you guys played with Barbies as as uh, kids, but yeah, almost like you used to do with your Barbies and change them for like different settings. Like who am I in London? Who am I in this other city? Like who am I in Mallorca? Uh, who am I when I go back to Mexico? Now I have that kind of like identity crisis when I go back to Mexico. I'm not quite sure who am I in Mexico anymore. Um, but yeah, it's it's fascinating how how the culture of different places, and obviously the weather uh, influences who, who we are constantly. Um, another, another theme in Claire's book that uh, call our attention is uh, the topic of dress and relationships and how um, Claire very beautifully associates a specific garments with a specific people in her life and the specific things remind her of members of her family, of friends. Um, there's a couple of very, very beautiful passages. Like one is in page 13, it's about her dad. It says, men's sleepwear never seems to change. I think of my father wearing striped pajamas as he sits in a hospital bed recovering from tuberculosis, smiling nurses either side. Striped pajamas occur again, this time not in black and white photograph, but in my memory. My father is sitting up in bed at home, just as he was in the hospital, reading a newspaper and shaking it to, the, to get the creases out. So that's, that's just one example of how she associates, in this case, the striped pajamas with memories of her father. Um, there is another one that I really enjoy reading, is the one called uh, The Cat. And she refers to what sounds like it is an ex-lover, and she says, one young man was rich and pampered. He folded his shirt and his underpants were snowy white. I think he thought I was an adventure. Then you appeared dark and glowing and she decided to make her peace with the world and lay purring around your neck, globules of saliva on her chin, looking at me through green chink eyes, plowing intermittently at your black jumper. Um, so yeah, this, these are only two examples. There's quite a lot uh, through the book of her associating garments with people. And that's, I feel like that's something we learn to do since very early stages. Um, do, you have, do you have memories of 
of people in your life, important people in your life to specific things that have stuck in your in your memories. What do you guys think of this? I would say definitely yes. And I actually, when we were talking earlier about like our own re memories with clothing, like early, kind of early in the conversation, the, most of the examples I could think of were actually like past boyfriends clothing. So what, not even my own, but it really stuck in my head um, or like things that I bought them even um, that really, yeah, it really kind of stuck with me. I'm, I'm not sure why, like probably more even than like the things I bought for myself. Um, so yes, and I would say also like with family members as well, like there's things that I just think of when I think of them, like clothes that they wear that I think of when I think of them. I, I feel like if I, um, when I think of my, my partner, he wears a lot of corduroy so if i had to associate him with a with a garment or a fabric it would be like corduroy trousers He's, he has like corduroy trousers in every color and it's not just obviously there's the, the visual side of it like you associate a person with a garment because you've seen it but it's obviously the senses and the feeling of in this case corduroy and of course the smell as well uh, because people's smells get stuck in their clothes um, so I, like my mom, my mom passed away 10 years ago, nine years ago, but I'm sure if I smell something from her, I would I immediately recognize it. Um, so there's like the specific textures, specific colors that we associate with, uh, with our friends, with family, with, uh, with memories. Um, my dad, when I was when I was a baby and my dad was in his twenties, he used to collect uh, Jordans. He had like a he had a collection of Jordans that like in Mexico in the in the nineties was like a very cool thing. He was he was very cool back back then. Um, so I, I associate Jordans with my dad, but with my dad being young, I don't associate them with him anymore because he doesn't wear them anymore. Um, so yeah, do you do you guys have things you that make remind you of someone? And also like ex ex boyfriends, Yana. That's, that's such a good, that's such a good uh, a good topic because there's not many people we we're constantly touching with uh, like, that we have relation like relationships that are so physical than with partners. Uh, so that obviously changes also the way we relate to their clothes because it's no longer just visually, it's obviously it's tactile, it's smell, maybe it's taste, it's like, uh, yeah, everything is a thing. And also I'm thinking like wearing their clothes as well. It's like one of, I mean, sometimes people swap clothes with their friends, but I think a lot of people wear the clothes of their partners too, or at least like in certain situations. Um, so there's like something there as well with that. I think for me, far away from boyfriends are grandmas. So most of the examples I get to think of really like come from my relationship with my grandma. And so disclaimer, I really love grandmas, like all of them, I think. Uh, so when it comes to like dress and relationships, I always think of like the conversations I always have with my grandma every time I, I see her because I always ask her um about like textiles and knitting because you used to knit quite a lot and how you can actually like make clothes with your hands and so uh, like yeah I think when it comes to like trying to to remember of things that are really like of, of garments that are related to to people I always think of that and not just now like I think that I have this relationship with with um, with clothes even when I was a teenager, I remember that I would go to her wardrobe and I would take like all the jackets and all that stuff. And they, because she's really like tall and big and like she, she doesn't look like me. So I remember I would wear all these jackets and they'd look like not good, but I wanted to wear them like so bad because I could feel like, okay, there's a connection here and I can really feel it. And when I'm wearing her, her clothes, they weren't like fashionable or anything, but I could really like feel like, okay, like she's, 
closer to me when I'm wearing clear clothes. So, yeah. Yeah, I um, I can relate to that a lot with my mom's clothes. Um, when she was in the 90s, um, she has a lot of blazer sets. And it speaks to what um, Lily mentioned earlier, where certain clothes speak to parts of your personality that you kind of want to embrace. And when I was going through her things, the things that stuck out to me were these blazer sets. And I love blazers. It's like all I wear. <laughs> and I think that because they had they had shoulder they have shoulder pads in them. So it's very like 90s, um, early 90s, late 90s. And yeah, I think that I mean it's it's something we've mentioned throughout the last hour and a half, where clothes are markers of our memory. And as we mentioned earlier, if we think that we let go of them, that the memory disappears with it because it's no longer there as a marker to remind you of it. And that's why we hold on to them. And I think that's also why I have certain pieces of jewelry, certain pieces of like footwear or just little accessories that I have with me every day to remind myself of my mom because she's in Canada or my grandma. And yeah, you do it subconsciously, but sometimes, uh, yeah, it's quite beautiful. I really love where this is going. <laughs> um, I actually, sorry, before we move, we, we move forward, like um, the grandma topic, and is, uh, I think it's a, it's a very special one for uh, for those people who were like fortunate enough to like meet their, their grandparents. And I, I, I remember my grandma and the way she used to, to dress and I never necessarily admire how she was dressed, but I, it was her and I could associate her words, her clothes to her. And it's very funny how now that I'm like getting, I'm, I'm near 30, I'm starting to become her uh, in the way I dress. Um, and I, I, dis I often discover myself buying things that I'm like, wait a second, my, my grandma will wear this. What happened to me? When, when did I become my grandma? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how, how grandparents influence you like that. Um, I, because I feel like her influence on me is much bigger even than my mom's. Um, yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty special. So I'd like to ask, because it's been an hour and a half, um, we have one or two questions left. If you're happy to continue or if you'd um, like to just greet everyone and say goodbye or stay. Is everyone happy to stay? To continue, but yeah. Okay, yep. good. Um, so in efforts not to trigger anyone, um, another topic that we've um, disclosed and uh, that we're going to disclose is dress and grief and it doesn't necessarily need to be the grief of someone passing it could be um, grieving a friendship that no longer exists or uh, Iana, an ex-boyfriend that you're no longer with um, so I'm going to read a passage um, about Claire's relationship with grief on page 173 if you'd like to follow along And it's called Recovered. And it's the last paragraph. And it starts by, she starts by saying, I imagine lying on the sofa, book in hand, and wondered if I should instead dress as cushions and cover to match myself, covers to match myself, white perhaps, to reflect my wardrobe of freshly laundered shirts, or gray, like my favorite old town coat, or black to echo my shadowy cor corpus of workwear. I like the thought of the sofa's cladding as a form of self-portrait, upholstery that would benefit that would befit me, seam for seam. And this like kind of goes back to what we were saying about embracing the different personalities. She was like kind of questioning, should it be white or should it be black in the different aspects of her personality? 
And then the last one is on page 174, where she just says, it's not so unreasonable, unreasonable to draw parallels between the held and the beholden. So let me suit that sofa and recover myself, stroke its arms and remember his. So she's talking about her, her father's passing and um, it's not so much a garment, but a chair that she wants to reupholster to kind of commemorate that memory. And if any of you would like to share your own thoughts or approach to dress and grief, if you have any that you'd like to share. I feel like that was a very, very recurrent theme in the book. Like, I feel like Claire, in one way or another, <clears throat> went through quite a lot of grief in her life, and she's very transparent about that. She talks about her parents passing away. She talks about her losing a baby. Um, she even has a, a chapter dedicated to a dog that is uh, her dog that is, uh, it sounds like it's ill or old, old and it's, it's about to pass way as well um and I thought also other kinds of grief like her house when it starts leaking and they have to sort of like dismount this home that they had created and like start all over again because the house was no longer um, um it could it, it, it inhabitable inhabitable yeah um so is there yeah, it's, it's a very recurrent thing with her. And it's very interesting how she, she creates these connections between those moments of grief and the clothes she was wearing, but also the clothes other people were wearing. Um, there, is, there is a chapter where she's about to attend uh, a yeah. funeral. She's going to attend a funeral and she says, we wore bright colors to, I think it was something like- It was to, push away the fear. To push away the fear, yeah. And we, something like, we pretend that we were going to a wedding, not a funeral, something like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it made me, it made me think how, what, what, what is my approach to dress every time I feel like I'm grieving something or I'm grieving someone and I, how sometimes I, I lose a bit the willing to make an effort. Um, and it, 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 but in some cases, it almost feels like you're honoring the situation or you're honoring the person by dressing in a specific way. Um, I felt like that, for example, when uh, one of my dear aunts passed away and she was, she was very, very fashionable and she was very stylish. And she was a single lady. She was she died when she was like 70 something, but she never got married. She was very rich, but self-made rich. Like I was very, very like, she was like my um my role model when I was a kid. Um and she passed away. And I remember feeling that if I like wearing black and like wearing something sad to her funeral was just wrong. Um, because of who she was um yeah so that's that's what comes to my mind that's what came to my mind when I was um reading these passages in Claire's book and I, I wonder how how you guys felt when you when you read that yeah for me I think um when she writes about grief it's so raw and so emotional that you know it kind of shocks you a little because you don't expect it almost in a book about kind of dress history and memoir um I think two points um I think my first one is about I totally agree um in terms of sort of dressing for a funeral you have to kind of honor that person it's something quite difficult to navigate between you know what's expected and how that person lived their everyday life um I know for me at my granddad's funeral um for me, I really felt that I had to dress smart, you know, because that's, he was always really smartly dressed. So, you know, it may, it makes sense to do things like that. Um, but obviously that's different for every person. So I think the idea of sort of funeral wear and grief around that is interesting. Um, I also think there's another interesting aspect to grief in Claire's book of grief in terms of not necessarily death, but in terms of, as you said, sort of relationships or friendships breaking down. Um, and again, I'm sort of speaking for myself, but, I think we've all had that feeling of 
you know, if a breakup or whatever has happened and you can't bear to wear those same clothes again. It's like they've become unlucky for a reason. <laughs> like, okay, they're going in the bin straight away. Um, and again, um, to that last point we were talking about, about sort of very specific smells or specific items of clothing reminding you of a certain person. I think there's always something, isn't there, about you kind of associate people wearing those same clothes with that same person and you're like oh well they're wearing this <laughs> or you know for me it was um someone wearing a barber jacket I don't know if anyone's familiar with barber jackets but like they have a certain wax on them that has a certain smell and um, it's a very specific smell and anytime I smelled that afterwards I was like it just reminds me of him <laughs> but um I think it, it's funny um these different kind of ways we can think about grief not necessarily in terms of death or of loss but in terms of you know relationships friendships breaking down and the role that clothes and material culture can play in this yeah absolutely now that you were saying you were mentioning clothes that were very related to that relationship that is over like you made me think of like this ex-boyfriend I once had that like he had this like he had a problem with alcohol and but I didn't really I, re I didn't really realize it until I was very immersed in the relationship but anyway every time we'll have like a fight over that he will go and buy me clothes because he knew I like clothes and he knew like that <laughs> he and I, yeah it, and it, it kind of worked every time for a while so I ended up with lots of clothes that were presents from him from like fights we had when he was feeling guilty and <laughs> trying to make up for it. And when we ended up breaking up properly, I didn't know what to do with all those things because I liked them, but in a way I was angry at them because they symbolized me being weak and staying in the relationship and like being like, okay, fine, I'll forgive you <laughs> instead of leaving. So suddenly all these like beautiful garments that I, I wanted to wear were not, were like cursed almost like I would just I was I was just angry at them um and in my grief of that relationship I, I got rid of lots of them uh, I only kept a few and I almost never wear them um but yeah it's interesting how some specific garments become like cursed during grief that's that's interesting because for me I have the opposite effect but it might be because like specifically talking about ex-boyfriends it's my first boyfriend and he bought me this necklace because I love butterflies and it has a little butterfly on it and he cheated on me but I haven't gotten rid of that necklace because it reminds me of I guess it's bittersweet because it was my first relationship and it was the most where I was the most vulnerable I wasn't tainted yet you know it was my first experience of everything so for me, that necklace just symbolizes my naivety and just, um, I don't think it's cursed because when I think of him, I don't think of him cheating. I think of the happiness that he brought me in my first relationship. Um, and he cheated on me in like at the very end. So I kind of just, my memory just pushed it out. <laughs> um, it wasn't, the whole relationship that he cheated on me but um yeah I think it's interesting how there's like two sides of that coin like you can either choose to keep the happy memories rather than the the ones that hurt or the reverse just a thought <laughs> came to mind when you were speaking now yeah can I just say something too I, I don't really have, I guess, personal examples, but all this reminds me of, of my aunt and my mom's sister. And she's always very stylish, right? But she hates black. So black for her means, I don't know, like something really bad has happened. And I think, see, exactly as we said earlier, I think Vanessa, you said it, like she wants to push away the fear. And that was always when I was a kid growing up and like, let's say that they had to go to a funeral somewhere and she had to wear black for that specific life for that occasion. She was really like, she didn't want to do it. And she would wear it, but you could see like on her face because that, that she wasn't like happy with it, not just because of like a funeral, but also just the fact, the mere fact that she was wearing black. And 
I, I guess that was always like very interesting for me. So because it makes me think about like the way we associate not just garments, but also the colors in garments as skirts. So we say like this color means that and I don't want to wear it. And yeah, like just a thought. <laughs> I agree with your aunt. Um, I was raised very Catholic and funerals, you have to be in only all black and it's black from head to toe. Like you have, like white is not allowed, no nude, it's head to toe black. Um, and I actually worked in a lingerie shop as well and our uniform was all black. And I was, I was depressed. I was grieving my personality being taken away from me going to work every day because I work there like four or five days a week um because for me black sucks out the life all black not black I mean I have black with a bit of color but um it has that effect on me because it it's so ingrained in my memory of wearing all black is associated to to death and funerals because that's how I was raised to believe it should be and as both Lily and Nawa were saying earlier about commemorating the person and Lily you wore a smart outfit to your granddad's funeral and um I think I think that's lovely and that it should commemorate the the person and not you know just what's expected of us and it's a it's it's a hard um battle <laughs> to to embrace one or the other it does feel very interesting yeah, totally. like how like the contradiction between the social convention and how we actually want to feel in a situation because like in the case of a funeral like the situation is all really pretty much sad and horrible and the social convention tells you you have to wear black uh, but like claire for example in the book says like i wear bright colors because i wanted to push away the, the sadness and that's probably what you want to do when you're in that situation. So it's like a tension between between the social convention and what you actually want to do and when, how do you actually want to feel, but also how people may react to that. Like, are they going to think you're being disrespectful if you wear a different color? Um, so I guess this uh, this resonates with the topic of of uh, tradition and ritual and. And if rituals and traditions should be updated, maybe should be uh, re-signified uh, in a way. Modernized. Uh, modern, yeah, um, adapted, um, but yeah. So we, unless Anna, you have something to add to that specific topic, um, we may move on Not to- Not really. I just thought it was interesting to hear about kind of how clothes have such an emotional response. And I think like you, you all mentioned, like not just, I think the, well, um, I think often we talk about like grief and love for clothes, but maybe not so much like anger or yeah, we also talk about joy for clothes as well. But I think like other more negative emotions we don't talk about so much. And I think there's also maybe um like a, desire to like dress for revenge as well which is kind of related to that kind of anger of especially like um when it's related to to someone that you might have been in a relationship with or um like you said like had bad experiences with i love that's that. so true <laughs> dress I love for that, too. that probably has to do with power you know we're wanting to feel empowered of or being like above someone else that you you're angry at. Never thought about the dress for revenge thing, but it's uh is related to this as well. And it's like just a topic of like dressing for different emotions. Um, is fascinating, and it's true that we I don't think we talk much about like so the so called negative feelings as much as we talk about feeling happy and wearing bright colors or going to a party and wearing feathers and sequins um yeah um so guys we are gonna start wrapping up our last question uh for you is just 
what are the what's the general feeling that the book left you with like what's how did how did you end up feeling by the time you finished reading like did you like the book would you recommend the book like would you read the book again in the future like what what was the general feeling that you have now Yeah, I think I'm definitely going to read it again. Uh, like, absolutely. I think this book is like, it's really amazing uh, because it, it manages to be like a very poetic and personal piece of writing. And that's not an easy thing to do. I think quite the contrary, it's really hard to, to be able to write like this and to express your feelings uh, on a like really deep, uh, level for me it managed to do like three really great things if I can sort of like number them I think it makes the reader realize that there's a deep connection between between them and their clothes their textiles etc even if they don't always realize it and um, also it sort of like prompts the reader to look closer into their intimate relationships with clothes or maybe it's just me but I I, I think even if you're not into like clothes and material culture as much, still it manages to make you feel like, oh, wait, you know, there is something here and I could maybe um, examine that, like think about it. And yeah, last but not least, I think it also like sort of invites the reader to look closer into the clothes and garments and, and objects themselves. So it makes you want to realize that there is a thought through structure behind what covers our, our bodies and what what's around us and yeah I don't know overall I think I would, it's 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 one of the best books uh, I've read and also I don't read books in English that much I mean in my spare time of course I will do it for research but in general I like reading in, in Greek more, because I can sort of like relate to the content more. Uh, but this time it felt really like I could hear like your thoughts and I could hear her talking and it felt really intimate. So a very intimate and very personal process. And it was really easy for me to, to read through the book and, and start feeling things. So I didn't feel this time with this book that language was a boundary. Um, yeah. That's very true. I, I relate to that as well because my first language is Spanish and I, I've i recently started to lear, read more literature in, in English. Um, so I used to just read like academic texts because most of the fashion academic texts are in English. Now I'm reading more literature in English and it sometimes is, is hard to immerse yourself as much as you do in your own language, but Claire has, it makes it very easy uh, for you to read, understand, and, and, and just immerse yourself in all these like descriptions. Um, yeah, like in a way, it even makes you like relax and you don't think about the words you don't know so much. <laughs> it's just like the, the content and your feelings and your, your memories and thoughts. And that's all that matters. And it's great. She yeah. nailed it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I also love that it was like it was written in short chapters and almost like at the end of every chapter, you need to take like a moment to digest what you just read and like let it sink. And but in a relaxing way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I relate to exactly what you just said right now. Um, I found that oftentimes I would reread the passage because I felt that I didn't fully grasp it or fully absorb the memory that she was describing or just yeah just let it sink in because it's so poetically written and as we've been mentioning it's very sensorial so she taps into touch and scent and it just encapsulates everything that clothes mean to us and she really makes herself vulnerable and lets us into that vulnerability and reading that 
makes us feel vulnerable and makes us think back to, you know, maybe some article of clothing that makes us feel the same way or makes us question or makes us wonder why we don't pay a little bit more attention to the clothes that we put on our bodies. Yeah. Regarding that point, I feel like the to me the biggest achievement of this book is that it gets to do something that is I feel like is really difficult to do for us like people who are interested in clothes. Uh, it needs to like explain to people who are absolutely not interested in clothes, uh, explain why clothes are relevant uh, without sounding like preachy or academic or um, annoying. <laughs> I feel like like I, I gave the I gave the book to my mother in law to read, and she's like completely like, she has no relation to to fashion in any way, not interested in fashion in any way. Um, and she absolutely loved it, like she enjoyed it so much. And it, we had a conversation after she read it, and she said, like, it really got me thinking about what I wear and what my loved ones wear and the things I treasure. And and clothes seem like a su very superficial thing, but it made me think that maybe they are not. Mm -hmm. And like to me, that's like the biggest achievement of Claire's book in that in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I um, really agree with both of your points you've made. Um, I think for me, the main sort of takeaway from it, well, first of all, it is a lot more, uh, you know, it's a lot sadder than I thought it would be <laughs> when I went into it. You know, I was kind of struck at various points, um, particularly when she talks about sort of grief or the baby, etc. Um, but the other takeaway, I think, is it kind of, this format where it's much more sort of experimental, much more poetic, kind of written in uh, fragments of sort of literal patchwork of text. Um, it makes me think of kind of why isn't other fashion theory written in this way? Or, you know, why aren't people allowed the freedom to write about clothes, which is such an emotional, um, an emotional object and has so many feelings tied to it. Why can't people kind of explore these different ways of writing about them, whether that be through, you know, um, a more sort of experimental approach or fragments, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and then just to that point of thinking about kind of introducing people who maybe aren't as interested in fashion or clothes um, to more sort of symbolic meanings. Back to that point about sort of funerals, etc. I think that's kind of a very easy uh, example for people to understand of you know you don't wear certain clothes to a funeral why is that what are these meanings or attaching to the clothes mm -hmm. why are we dressing in terms of kind of uh, armor for example I know that's a, a term that comes up a lot but you know this idea of you dress smart and it's kind of it protects you in a way when you're going into these situations and I think um, funerals or weddings can be a, an easy way for people to understand that and both of those kind of come up in Claire's book. Um, so yeah, I think the main takeaway for me is it points to a more sort of interesting way of thinking about kind of fashion criticism or even art history at large. That's actually a very interesting point, like how, yeah, because it, it does, I mean, it's obviously not an academic book, it's an autobiography, but yeah, like why, why are people not being more experimental in the way they write about fashion? It's a, it's an, I think it's a really good question to take away. On that note, um, so at LCF, there's a PhD student called Shirley Vander Boulder, I think, and she's writing her dissertation. It's related to a creative writing approach and she's at London College of Fashion. I have no idea what she does. We just have the same supervisor. Um, but it might be worth like looking into what she's yeah. written because she has some publications if you're interested in that, Lily. Um, but I wanted to say that I'm excited to read the rest of the book. I think this conversation has really shown that it's very relatable and it's something that you can draw so many topics out of and you don't need to be like a fashion historian or dress historian um to be able to connect to this book which I think is really amazing and I would love to know more what people like kind of like the every every average person thinks of this book it'd be great to yeah I think pass it on as well 
Um, but I really love the title, A Life Amongst Clothes. And I felt like that's so much what we were talking about today was our lives amongst clothes. And then mm-hmm. it also reminded me of another quote by Claire, which is like clothes are a shorthand for being human, which I think is in, um, it's written in uh, Lou Taylor's book. It's like the entrance um, beginning passage. And I think that really, again, like connects to maybe like her life's work actually. And this idea of like being human amongst clothes. Yeah. I love that. Um, so just to close, I'd like to read one last passage um, that we think encapsulates, encompasses everything that we've been talking about today and the importance of dress. Fabric is so compliant. All it takes is a needle and thread to give it some purpose. There are pros and cons to this flexibility. Its survival is threatened not by being dropped on the floor, as the porcelain teacup I'm holding would be, but by wear and tear. The effects of light, moths, stains, damp, rubs, and abrasions, cutting. I think of the havoc my scissors could have as I chop away at my frayed jeans and throw the fragments into the bin. I won't trip over now, I think. Pleased to have gotten away with not having, a sti- not having to stitch them up properly. But before I know it, I'm airborne. Um, so yeah, with yeah. that with that quote, we wrapped up, guys. It's been such a pleasure having this conversation with you guys this evening. Um, a few reminders: uh, we have the conversation with Claire on the 13th. We're gonna send you the for those of you who are in London or gonna be in London for the event. Uh, we're gonna send you the address. And for those of you who are not going to be in London, I is going to be live streaming soon, and you're still going to be uh, able to ask Claire questions and uh, speak to her directly. We're going to have a good setup for that. Um, but the live event is is very intimate. It's uh, it's going to be like between ten and fifteen people only. What we want is to be um, in person. I mean, uh, we want to sit down with Claire and more than feeling like a like a talk from her we want to really have a conversation and tell her all these thoughts that we've been discussing and like and ask the questions we we have for her um and there's gonna be drinks and the idea is that it's gonna be very chill and friendly and and relaxed and uh, and then on the 9th of november we have the workshop with fausta um that's gonna be digital and that's gonna be really fun. Uh, Fausta is preparing uh, a few dynamics because the workshop is designed for um, really for, for beginners. Uh, it's not necessarily for people who are very experienced in writing uh, literature. Um, it's a very experienced to write academically and to write literature. And uh, one of the things we, uh, we extract from Claire's book is just the, the willingness to, to try to, to um to to like not to not to write a memoir necessarily but it got us really inspired to write about our clothes and uh fausta she's a, an expert on like helping beginners um to get inspired uh to write so that that workshop is really is going to be really great i believe she's designed it in a way that it's going to be all about one specific garment uh that each one of us own. Uh, so we will send you more information close to the date. But um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, thank you. This was a really fruitful conversation. Really enjoyed hearing all of your personal stories. Yeah, thank you so much. It was amazing. Absolutely loved it. Thank, thank you for yeah. sharing. And um, it was really good to see you. Likewise. Uh, lovely to see you as well. <laughs> Take care, guys. Have a lovely night. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.